Hello team and welcome to part two of the Ukraine war news update uh, with ATP Geopolitics, myself, John and MSPs for the 13th of August 2023. We're going to start in Belgorod actually, reported battles underway 10 kilometers from Ukraine. I've not seen any other uh, confirmation of this. This came out last night. Eyewitnesses report that near the village of Krasnaya Yaruga in Belgorod region, this is in Russia, sounds of battle are heard. So you might see... Uh, uh, Belgorod is up here, so this is my map. This has not been updated from yesterday. Uh, I did my up, uh, frontline update very late last night. Uh, so anyway, Belgorod uh, region is there. Somewhere along this border, there is activity. I was thinking yesterday that actually we haven't heard much about uh, the sort of Russian Free Legion Volunteer Corps and what, what have you active along these areas that we saw previously and i was wondering whether that's because they were using things like american and polish equipment and they got a rap on the knuckles and were not allowed to be seen to be using that inside russia and that's probably why we haven't seen them since uh, we did see one uh a Czech or no georgian unit i think uh, inside the uh, the Russian borders doing an ambush on a truck uh, and they weren't seen to be using so overtly um, Western provided weapons so I, I don't know whether that's because they're being sort of careful and, and they're not allowed to do that with things like Humvees and whatnot uh, but it, but I was thinking this is this would be a fantastic time to be doing stuff like this on the borders there to really keep the Russians thinking like if you can use elements like these Russian core you know units that you aren't going to be sending to the front line right if they can start making a real nuisance of themselves themselves along this front line or along this border region then or even further to the west then that that's really going to keep the the russians thinking and and be a be a thorn in their side uh so anyway uh no confirmation of that but might be something to keep an eye on up in the kupiansk area this is getty saying that east of the village of Sinko, sinkivka and northwest of the village of persia travnevi russian troops have advanced along three forest belts and two forest plantations i don't know whether this is new to what was already claimed or so for example what i was saying last night or whether this is adding on to uh the the gains that the russians have already made in this area to the north near sinkivka here this is around kupiansk which is to the southwest there uh so there might be extra gains or that might just be uh building on to what has been said previously so this is in uh, two slight bits there so this is in this area so those are those two darker bits um and that would suggest that that's gray zone um and yeah so that would suggest here and there but that's all in gray zone so actually surat maps has pushed the russian um front line or defensive lines further on so actually according to Syria maps of Russian defensive lines are further on from there. So that probably is reflecting what Syria maps has already said. Uh, despite Russia's efforts to carry out assaults near Kupiansk and Kharkiv Oblast, that's the area we we're talking about, the Russian forces don't have even tactical level successes in the area, according to a Ukrainian military spokesperson. So uh, this could be uh, very much uh, trying to control the narrative by the Ukrainians but, you know, this is Cherovati, one of their, their spokesmen we, we often hear from. According to him, the Russians have been trying to seize the initiative near Sinkivka and even Ivka in the Kupiansk sector in northeastern Ukraine, where they conducted eight assaults, 328 shelling attacks and 10 air raids on August the 11th. Uh, alone cherovati says that over that day in the area the russian troops lost 69 people 97 wounded two 272 tanks three armored vehicles a d30 howitzer a help mortar and a command and observation post for a long time they've been unable to make significant progress there even at the tactical level for a long time that doesn't mean like actually in the last day though we have built the a competent defense our grouping has been reinforced with reserves interesting um, we know that the leaders of the Russian units and, and their plans, we know the leaders and their plans, and we are defending ourselves based on that, uh, he said. So that is kind of saying, hey, nothing to worry about here. Yes, they are they are kind of probing and attacking, but they are not uh, causing us any major problems. We know what their plans are, and we have uh, the reserves to deal with them. 
um, which is what we have heard uh, and what we have also, when we're being our most positive, when I've been my most positive, that's what I, I've been sort of saying. Yes, the Ukrainians have the heights around here. They can control uh, what the Russians do to a certain extent. Do they have enough, though? There are some that, that think that the Russians actually had some quite high force concentrations in the area uh, along the whole northeastern sector. So they could cause the the Ukrainians some serious trouble there. Don't know much about what's going on in Bakhmut. No news. So I'm going to really pop down to the southern front to Urujani, where apparently Urujani has been taken by the Ukrainians. Uh, there is a lot of talk about this. The Russian, many Russian sources, uh, loads of Russian sources saying that's happened. I, I had others to sh share with you, but there's no point. There's just lists of Russian telegram sources uh, talking about that. Russian officers confirmed the liberation of Urujani, also known as Harvest is imminent the enemy outplayed us is the quote we are losing the uh, the harvest for several days we withstood its onslaught but somewhere there was a failure we are still fighting back but the situation is not in our favor the enemy has already tried to hoist hoist the flag on the village council today but one armor was blown up the artillery worked on the rest and they pulled back but this is the matter of time and although the capture of this village will cost the enemy a great price its loss after such heroic resistance is painful for us it does not console but slightly reconciles with the situation and if he takes each village in the same way as harvest it will soon end we hope that we will somehow dodge and push the enemy back but we have to be realistic this is actually a mixed bag of nuts so this is on the one hand saying yeah we're pretty much pushed out of Urujani, but also saying we are costing the ukrainians quite a lot and if they try and take every village like this and have the losses they have at Urujani, then this will be over uh so I don't, whether you can take that seriously, whether there's an element of truth to that, probably. I assume the Ukrainians will be losing casualties in quite significant numbers when they're attacking places like this. But there you go. Romanov, the pro-Russian, who's apparently had a order put on his head by a by the local forces to be handed over to the FSB. Uh, he's reported he's an ultra nationalist uh, hanging around actually in the Kherson area more, but he's uh, he has a lot of contacts. He's reported that uh, Ukraine controls Urujani. Um, in and just to remind you where that is, so coming out, going down south, uh, bypassing Bakhmut. I reported on that last night. This is Urujani here, and uh, the Veliko Novosilka salient sector where you've got the uh, the river coming down here, meandering its way between uh, Staromirska and Urujani, and it appears that Urujani is under the control of the Ukrainians. So it could be that the Ukrainian front line does something like that, uh, but who knows? It might just be, you know, just like that. Uh, and then, it, you know, uh, Zavitne Bajanya could be next on uh, the target list for the ukrainians as well as trying to interdict the road between kamenchik and novodonetsk uh, the the claims that they've already done that but taking kamenchik would be really significant because then the two settlements behind it would be in a lot of trouble uh, and also taking a regime allows them to kind of flatten out this front line and perhaps uh, eat into this the remaining russian forces on the higher ground near priyutny uh, so anyway irizhani appears to have fallen uh, or at least been liberated, sorry. And again, I mentioned this earlier in, in part one that JDAMs are being uh, witnessed far more frequently on uh, the front line, different areas of the front line. Here, recently, two JDAMs hit this high rise building in Urujani and eliminated the entire position from which Russians were coordinating their operations, probably killing every Russian there. So, this is uh, a significant hit on a what is claimed to be a command and control center in Urujani. Uh, and that, if that was the case, then you know that's that's a lot of trouble for the the Russians. Now, here this is talking about Urujani as well. So Urujani is there, and we have some big red arrows. This is talking about the the Russian forces in the area. Uh, and we'll dip into this from David D. Okay, from what we're getting from Telegram is that the 337th Marine Brigade was moved up to help the 60th Brigade holding the town. It was not enough, and a request for the support went out to the 37th Brigade uh, on the right. The tanks moved out, but never made it. The tanks were lost. All the Marines were wounded or uh, prisoners of war. And the 60th Brigade has pulled back a... 
a uh, a hard win for Ukraine. But now in the sector, the 37th, the 337th, the 60th, the 247th, and probably all are probably all combat ineffective right now. 136th, 34th, and 218th tank regiments are the only real forces in the area, and they have had losses as well. What this then suggests is that you could see a domino effect because actually the Russians have been attrited so uh, significantly in the area. And this is what I've talked about a lot, which is the harder the Russians defend every meter, the more difficult it is for the Ukrainians. Uh, and it appears like the Russians are doing a fabulous job of defending. But the but the ramifications of that is when they do finally lose places like Urujani, the the loss ratios have been so devastating for them that actually they've got nothing left in the tank. They've got a whole bunch of combat ineffective units, uh, as opposed as according to David D here, that that are you know high supposedly high quality units uh, that that are unable to further defend, and the momentum gains gathers for the Ukrainians, and uh, it, it could be a domino effect. It could be, uh, although the Russians may still find the. Uh, the reserves or the ability to continue defending. We shall see. Right, then going across to uh, Robotna, the armed forces of Ukraine advance in two directions on the Zaporizhia sector of the front. Fighting continues in a village of Robotna and towards the village of Vibova. So this is to suggest that there are gains to the west here in the directions of Vibova and around Robotna itself as well. Uh, we shall see. I don't know 100%. There's, there are some varying claims about Robotna. It seemed pretty positive yesterday. Uh, updated map from Deep State over the past few days. They say Ukrainian forces were able to enter Robotna but were unable to gain a foothold. I, I don't know if that's a little bit old, uh, whether that, that actually they have now. That was possibly initially the case. Um, so a few maps here. This is Robotna there. Uh, and then showing that it's now, you know, more grey zone. This is up near the cemetery and that and that uh, Robotna town um, sign that I talked about yesterday. Uh, so, you know, it might be fairly difficult, might not. Uh, this is someone talking about the situations both at Urujani and Robotna. Uh, the work of the armed forces of Ukraine was quite a success. Uh, an area of five square kilometers was liberated along the bridgehead. It's not yet known whether the Russian forces have returned positions in the northeast of the settlement. Uh, so that's in um, uh, Urujani. And then going on to Robotna, it also began to rain. It, it can across the throat of the armed forces of Ukraine and interfere with the offensive. Um, oh, no, that's, uh, that's sorry, that's Robotna. In Urujani, is now fighting, and he goes on to talk about how. Uh, the Ukrainians are advancing into the village without significant losses uh, and uh, are destroying the Russian army. Aviation was involved, so I showed you those J dams. So this is um, this is a claim that actually the uh, is starting to rain in the area, but uh, the Ukrainians are liberating large amounts of area in the Robotna sector. So uh, that's here. So more of the north of the town taken and down. Uh, possibly fighting down on the east as well uh, there. And then um, this is Phillips O'Brien referring to, you know, talking about that game of whack-a-mole that I was mentioning yesterday, which is do the Russians have the reserves to support the, the defence of the uh, of the left bank of the Dnipro River, or are they going to be drawing them from the Zaporizhia forces which were themselves drawn from the Kherson forces and you know moving reserves around is a real issue for them. Ukrainian military analyst uh, Mashevets reports that the Russians are hectically sending their strategic reserves to Kherson region in order to counter the ongoing Ukrainian build-up of a bridgehead on the eastern bank of the Dnipro River. Exactly what I was talking about, and uh, I, I imagine they are. I imagine they are. You've been pretty frantic, the Russians, at the moment in that uh, dangerous game of whack-a-mole. Um, right, moving on to military aid. There's not really a lot to mention here. Uh, Germany's Rheinmetall is to deliver lunar drone systems to Ukraine. Rheinmetall, Germany's automotive and arms manufacturer, will deliver a lunar new generation drone system to Ukraine by the end of 2023. Built and Sontag, uh, and Sontag. So that's the I presume the Sunday built, uh, reported on August 12th, 
uh, citing company sources. The package will consist of a ground control system with several drones, a launch catapult, and military trucks, according to built um, and this is what it looks like and that appears to be the catapult system as a range of 150 kilometers can fly i presume that means can fly for 12 hours uh, and the, the ukrainians are soon to get that so that would be uh, pretty cool uh, looks more like or well, looks like a reconnaissance drone but it, i don't know whether you can fit um fit some munitions on the bottom there who knows uh on the other side of the coin russia is now producing iranian drones on its own having changed some of the components and structure conflict armament research states according to analysts the interior of the body has lost the so-called b structure meaning that the drone has become simpler inside it is noted that experts have found more than 100 components from 22 different companies based in seven countries including china switzerland and the us so that's a worry if they can start producing these um indigenously in russia then they don't need to import them from uh, from iran and if they can get all the parts for them and produce them in significant quantities uh, this will be a problem for the ukrainians of course right moving on to geopolitical uh, things here is a good friend um ramzan kadyrov and when i say good friend of course i mean uh arch nemesis and horrible human being a quote we're 100 percent better than them so this is the russians against the ukrainians so why negotiate he's saying that we should not negotiate we have to finish them off and that's it he spoke out categorically against negotiations with kiev we are winning on all fronts both on the battlefield and the international political arena all that remains is to see it through to the end wow like what planet is he living on this is my opinion for russia is not uh for Russia today, it is not profitable to introduce negotiations. Uh, Ukraine is losing positions every day. What, what about R Russia losing positions? I mean, uh, some of these people look, he's like, really? Really? This guy's like, are you sure? He's like, mm, no, I'm not too sure about that. He's like, oh, what am I having for dinner? So I, I don't know. I don't know. Although some fairly impressive beards. Uh, so there is that. Uh, moving on. Zelensky in the top of Americans' Americans' preferences in second place after Prince William. Well done, Prince William. Well done for, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what he's done. And far ahead of Joe Biden. Uh, so Americans are big fans of uh, Prince William and in second place, Zelensky. He, and he's won. So here it says a new Gallup uh, Institute, a new poll by the Gallup Institute shows that Americans have a better view of public figures from abroad. It is noteworthy that only Prince William and Vladimir Zelensky have bipartisan support in the US among these public figures. It's pretty interesting there. Um, so uh, that's something. Uh, Greece joins a G7 declaration that provides security guarantees to Ukraine, becoming its 14th sig signee uh, signatory, uh, the Ukrainian president says. So uh, let's have a, a little dip into this. Uh, I'm grateful to Greece for joining the G7 declaration to support uh, of support for Ukraine. Greece became the 14th country in support security guarantees for Ukraine. I'm grateful to the prime minister, which is good because if they hadn't and uh, Greece was, you know, it all went wrong in Greece, I might not get home. Um, uh, but there you go. Uh, following the recent NATO summit in Vilnius, the G7 countries adopted a declaration of security guarantees that would be in place before Ukraine joins NATO. The Ukrainian presidential office assured that the security guarantees received by Ukraine would not be a Budapest II, referring to the 1994 Bud Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances, under which Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange for security assurances from Russia, the UK, and the US. In 2014, Russia invaded Ukraine. And it, when people like uh, Tommy T Tuberville and American uh, politicians are being a bit uh, downplaying support for Ukraine, it, it must be... It must be noted that they are kind of contractually obliged to support Ukraine. We must remember this. There's an agreement. Okay, Russia have uh, obviously not fulfilled their part of the obligation, but the US and the UK here like, are signed up to support Ukraine. So if America stops their support for Ukraine by listening to some of the right-wing fringe groups uh, in the US, then they would actually be um defaulting 
on on a, an agreement and that is that's not cool so anyway there you go that's the geopolitical news i have for you there's probably an awful lot more out there i'm going to go down the beach uh, so thank you so much for your support really do appreciate it um please like subscribe and share and uh, I may, I'm going to be out on uh, possibly a day trip tomorrow. So I might not be able to do any videos tomorrow or the next day. I'm not really sure exactly what we're doing. But uh, uh, I'll be there when I'm there. And when I'm not, I won't. Uh, and that means precisely very little. Uh, take care. Speak soon.